everybody. Uh, it's Dr. Rick here dropping in on you. Hope everybody has had a good week up until this point. Uh, look, there's a lot going on uh, on the business side, personal side, but I still move on. I am excited about what we're doing business-wise. I'm excited about what we're doing in the community, even though we are strained. And with that being said, uh, I'm going to encourage you, if you believe in the work we do, go to the description box and use one of the resource links or information to show your love and support and donate to the work we do. Um, I want to talk to you about the elephant in the room. Uh, this is a complex elephant. It's not one uh, particular element or component. It is a complex dynamic of situations in our community, in our homes, in our culture uh, that we love to ignore and pretend does not exist. We stumble over it. We move around it. We duck and we dodge it, but we don't confront it head on. And I am a firm believer in the old African proverb of if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. Uh, for those of you who have followed me for any time, you are aware of the work that I've done over the last 30 years, and I will continue to do as long as I can breathe. Uh, I have, though, uh, decided that I am not going to put me or my family at risk in the sense of overextending myself uh, when there seems to be no care or concern for anyone from anyone else. And I know that I'm, you know, applying that in a blanket statement because obviously there are people who care and there are people who have given, uh, and I love you guys and I appreciate you guys, even the ones who haven't given, but show up every day and show your love and support. Thank you. Uh, but I do want to, again, point to the fact that likes, shares and comments are great but they don't pay bills they don't cover costs they don't serve as resources now if enough of them happen and something goes viral then enough people will eventually see and give uh, that that that's the connection with that but as a general rule we have to understand that there's a responsibility associated with the demands that we want to place on life and if we want black empowerment we can't stand on the sidelines and hope someone else does it. We can cannot be surveyors of the game and not participants. I'm sorry, it's not going to work. It has not worked to this point, and it will not. Um, the enemy wins every time we look at a situation and we stand idly by hoping it works itself out. With that being said, I want to talk to you about this complex elephant in the room. An elephant that I discovered uh, more than 30 years ago, one that I became intimately acquainted with a little over 20 years ago when working with uh, some of my female clients. Um, I'm gonna start there. I'm gonna start with my female clients, childhood, sexual abuse, and incest. There was a point in time, like I said, over 20 years ago, I'm working with clients and I'm noticing what is appearing to be some abstract phenomenon in the way of almost every black female that came in to see me for whatever reason. And we're not talking about everybody's coming in because they're depressed. I'm talking about no matter what they came in to see me for, as we begin to peel back layers, as we begin to probe, uh, to look for uh, reasons for XYZ or to understand XYZ behavior, we inevitably ended up somewhere in their childhood where they were being molested, raped, and many times by the very men who should have been their protectors, their fathers, their uncles, their older brothers and cousins. Um, I have clients now in their 60s who are still battling the demons of CSA, childhood sexual abuse. And that's just one of the elephants in the room. And uh, so it, 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 as it turned out, I thought, you know, uh, there's something going on here or I just happen to be a magnet for women who have been uh, abused as children. 
And so I called a colleague and I asked them what were they getting? And they said, hey, man, I'm getting the same thing. I called a female colleague and she said, hey, this is common. And so I looked for the data and it wasn't a great deal of data on it. So we launched research and we ins uh, inspired, encouraged and pushed uh, larger uh, institutions to do research. And what we found is on the liberal side of things as high as 60 percent of black females have in some way experienced childhood sexual abuse and on the conservative end the real conservative the lowest numbers you get is 40 plus percent that's almost 50 percent on the conservative end of our women who have in some way been violated before they ever reach adulthood uh, there's a problem and it is consistent and it is a failure on our behalf and there's so much that goes along with that what i found with my clients is not only had they been victimized but they had been ostracized they had been threatened the family had treated them as if they were the bad person in the family while protecting most times their violator the predator got the protection the victim got blamed uh, when they got older and they decided that they were going to confront their demons and they were going to open up and expose the family turned on them it's 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 an unspoken rule you don't put that out you don't deal with that we deal with that in the house but we deal with that in house but the problem is they weren't dealing with it in house they weren't handling it and in many instances they were going to their pastors the clergy uh the community spiritual leaders and they were being told not to say anything to law enforcement because they would take him out of the home and in many cases go far enough back he was the primary breadwinner the the provider in the home and they couldn't afford to so you just remained uh at, at risk in the home we haven't dealt with that we haven't dealt with it because we're still not holding the people in the in the in the home responsible for protecting our children and let me be clear here while the emphasis in this statement has been placed on black women there's a significant number of black males who are also violated as young boys uh, the numbers say one in six one in eight conservatively and liberally and i estimate that the numbers are higher because males are less likely to report being sexually abused um, and so we can speculate that it's much higher than that also it's important to say that it's not just males that are violating these children. Uh, women do it as well. So I, I want to be clear in this. Um, but I think that we are going to have to talk about the uncle who is at the family reunion and everybody saying, keep your kids away. from." Why is he there? Why do we have to worry about protecting the kids? Because he's there. The dynamic behind that has been a problem, and I've been talking about it for years, and there is a consequence to this that I am going to get to in a moment. That's just one of the complex dynamics that I've encountered in my research and in my desire to help and to heal our community. It gets, it gets, it's, it, it's not over yet. Then there is post-traumatic slave syndrome. Uh, something introduced in that terminology by my colleague, Dr. Joy DeGruy, uh, who has also done some great work in another area that I've spent a lot of time in, and that is African-American adolescent and young adult male violence, which I'm going to get to in a moment. But post-traumatic slave syndrome is something I've spent a lot of time in. Uh, it's where I discovered epigenetics that has given me an understanding of many of the other complex elements and components and dynamics that we're going to talk about real briefly. I don't plan on being too long, but I want to be here long enough for you to understand that we are dealing with this internal uh, conflict, this internal 
toxicity, this internal cancer, that if we don't do something about it, it's not going to matter whether or not they give us reparations. It's not going to matter whether we can stop cops from killing us. It's not going to matter if we can get a footing in the academic system and get equal access and equal opportunity. We've got problems that are buried deep inside of us that are impacting our health outcomes, impacting our behavior, impacting our capacity to build solid, healthy relationships and sustain them over time. We've got problems. When looking at post-traumatic slave syndrome, I developed a theory in my research called cognitive, uh, collective cognitive bias uh, syndrome. And it is the collective experience of African Americans, the descendants of slaves here in this country, that has created an ideal ideology, a thought process, a unique cultural paradigm through which we view life. And it is in the this view that we have this warped or marred sense of reality, and it impacts our behavior. It impacts our ability to process everything from being consumer-minded to being hostile towards one another to not being able to get along to filling the need as men to compete with one another. It's all a part of this collective cognitive bias, but uh, the destruction of property and so many other things that are common with inside of the community. And what we like to do is those of us who have found some semblance of success, we like to get out and then pretend we were never there, pretend that because we now keep a very clean house, because we now have uh, square footage, because we now drive a luxury vehicle, that we don't know what happens in the community, that we didn't experience it firsthand, and that in many instances, we were victims of it, we were participants in it, and we had to struggle and fight to get our way out. We are not looking back in the way that we should. We are not looking back with a focus and a center that says, I'm going to be a part of the solution. We're not doing it. We are looking and we love to post, oh my God, shaking my head. That's evil. But we're not willing to talk about where it came from. See, these violent outbursts by young black males isn't coming from them because they were born violent. It's coming because there's an emptiness inside of the community where there are 1.5 million men missing. 1.3 of them are incarcerated. Going to get to that in a minute too. See, there's this complex dynamic that is literally pressing and crushing the hopes of black empowerment. We can talk about it. We can talk about it till we're blue in the face. We can talk about it until um, we have three to four generations descending from our own very loins. We can talk till we have great, great grandchildren and nothing's going to change if we don't intercept the problem. If we don't engage the problem, we are going to still wake up and see the same situations, the same issues, but they will be exacerbated. They will be worse than they were when we first became aware of them because we aren't engaging the problem. This isn't something the cancer has to be extracted. The toxicity has to be detoxified. We've got to get it out of our mindsets, our cultures, our behavior. The things we tolerate and accept have to be uh, adjusted. We need to raise our standard. We need to have a code of conduct. We need to have a process and a program of socialization like Black Man Lead to where we are socializing young black males into an identity of positive masculinity and manhood that will uh, serve them and our community in the future. We have a problem. This this whole idea that we can ignore multi generational trauma, the epigenetic influence of environmental stress upon our gene expression, something that I've talked about, I've lectured on internationally. Um, everything's from epigenetics and psychology to epigenetics and cancer I've lectured on. Um, and the influence of epigenetics in long-term health outcomes, something I'm about to get into. Um, then there's the black-on-black -black crime myth. But where is it coming from? Uh, uh, like I said, 
the our work cross uh my work and uh the work of Dr. Uh, Dr. Grew cross paths again when we start talking about African American adolescent and young adult male violence. It was Dr. DeGrew who created the first uh, that I'm aware of African American adolescent young adult uh, respect scale because we learned that the feeling of being res disrespected is the number one variable in uh, predicting the risk for violent behavior in the black male. Feeling disrespected. Number two is the lack of proper racial socialization. Number three is uh, being the victim of violence. Number four is witnessing violence. Number five is urban hassle. Urban hassle is the things that the average kid in the inner city has to deal with. Gun violence, uh, 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 gunshots all night, sirens all night, noise all night, navigating drug use to get to school and home, navigating gang uh, activity to get to and from home, uh, mid in the East and the Midwest, L trains, all, all times of the day and night, shaking buildings. All of this stuff is called urban hassle. It puts a kid on edge. It messes with their neurological system. It makes them more agitated and more likely to commit violence. But the number one is disrespect. And this whole black on black crime is uh, something that has been taken from our suffering and given a phenomenal uh, assignment. In other words, it, it's supposed to be some phenomenon when in truth, violence is proximal. Uh, no matter what race you look at, the vast majority of the violence is committed by other people in that race. 84% of homicides in the white community are committed, committed by other whites. This is the reality. This is the truth. But but we, we, we still have a problem because we can't afford to kill ourselves. We can't afford to turn in our anger and our frustration on one another. And that's what's happening because where there's no hope, where there's no sense for a black man, when I cannot exercise my natural uh, desire to have a sense of power, of force, and to be able to lead and have a place. I try to take it at some point. I try to overimpose my will upon things. When I don't have proper socialization and when I am not aware of my racial identity and my racial responsibility as a man to not just myself, but my family, my progeny, my spouse, uh, my community, the other males in the community, when I don't understand the role and the responsibility because there's an absence of it being modeled because there are 1.3 million of us in prison and another 200, 300,000 that have checked out drug use, uh, mental health issues, and so many more. And then you look and we're looking at a 75% single parent household rate. There's a problem. there's a problem and and then the idea of toxic behavior being assessed and assigned next to masculinity to create the idea that anytime a black man does something that is un, uh, uh, that, that that does something that doesn't set well with the masses it's toxic and it's toxic masculinity no the true nature of masculinity is, is positive there's no such thing as toxic masculinity that's toxic behavior that we assign masculinity to no masculinity in its very own uh very own nature in its truest sense is protection it's provision it's leadership it's nurturing, it's empowering by way of inspiration and, 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 and support, whether it be my spouse, whether it be my child, whether it be my family, whether it be inside of the community. I execute my masculinity by creating an environment in which everyone else around me is safe. That's masculinity. Machoism isn't masculinity. Hyperviolence isn't masculinity. It's a lack of control, which is diametrically opposed to the idea of masculinity. But what happens is there's this ongoing push, especially within the black community, within the music industry, within the entertainment industry in general, that misogynistic behavior 
is how you express your masculinity. The more you disrespect your women, the more powerful and masculine you are. And then there's a message being sent to the women that in order to be owned, in order to be cared for, you've got to accept this behavior from men. As long as they got the bag, find you a place, be cute. You, you, you being robbed of your identity, of your spiritual nature and the ability to bear, bear dreams, bear visions through your spiritual womb. You, 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 you've been robbed of a sense of identity, the power of your unbelievably complex uh, capacity to uh, picture and visualize things. The ability to plug into a man and open him up and expose him to himself in a way that drives him to do something exceptional and extraordinary beyond what he even dreamed he can do. You are the bearer of the spiritual womb, but they don't want you to know that. They want you to talk about the BBLs and the, ba the body and the bag. The women are chasing the perfect body. The men are trying to get the bag because that's how you manipulate the woman. And we're not building together. We're not growing together because we have not socialized our children into a true understanding of who they are. So they know how to carry themselves. They know how to work and build and do. We've got a problem. Adverse childhood experiences. Another element of... Uh, Epigenetics, the influence of environment upon genetic expression. What we know is, regardless of age, that uh, when you're exposed to highly stressful situations, it literally creates chemical uh, tags above the gene, and it impacts the capacity of the gene to properly read DNA and transcribe it into RNA, which tells the gene in the body what to do. It can down-regulate and up-regulate genes, meaning it can turn a gene on and it can turn a gene off. See, we have genes that are designed specifically to keep us healthy. They function and work and operate our immune system. And when you are in stress, the, one of the things that's attacked the most is the genetic uh, predisposition to heal ourselves, to protect ourselves. And what happens? Um, the, uh, the, the immune gene downregulates. The cancer gene upregulates development, cancer. Autoimmune system downregulates Autoimmune deficiencies like lupus upregulate. Then we talk about these same environmental stressors in children, and we call these specific 10 stressors. Uh, matter of fact, we call these 10 uh, specific stressors ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. These aren't just any adverse childhood experiences. This isn't about getting an F on a test. These are ones that have long lasting implications. And I did a workshop um, for Wellspring Family and Community Institute, uh, which is founded and ran by a colleague and friend, Dr. David Jones. Uh, I did it for uh, him and Harris County Sheriff's Office, as you can see on there um, and families of men who are incarcerated uh, to explain the impact of adverse childhood experiences on our youth. I'm going to read you the 10 ACEs that are counted when we are giving an ACE score. Every child has an ACE score from 0 to 10. Um, we start getting problems at 3 to 4. Um, I have a client who has 8 ACEs eight um, and we're going to understand the implication of that but number one physical abuse number two verbal abuse number three sexual abuse number four physical neglect number five emotional neglect number six an alcoholic parent or a parent that is dependent upon some substance addicted uh, an incarcerated family member the disappearance of a parent through divorce death or abandonment A family member diagnosed with a mental 
illness. And 10, a mo the mother is a victim of domestic violence. When you get to four aces, the neurological and genetic impact of this not only impacts the long reaching uh, consequences of their psychological health, it has a negative influence on their physiological health. They are called health outcomes. And, and what we know is with four ACEs, a child is 12 times more likely to attempt suicide. They are four times, more, no, two and a half more times likely to develop uh, type 2 diabetes, two and a half more times to develop an autoimmune deficiency, four times more likely to develop some form of cancer. Uh, and I can go on and on of these health outcomes uh, to become sexually uh, promiscuous, uh, to take on other risky behaviors. Um, but these, and, and here's the thing, even, and people say, well, if you're taking risky behavior, obviously certain things are going to take place. Well, what we can tell you is in the studies that we've done, from the original study from Kaiser and the CDC on up to more recent studies, even when the person who experienced these adverse childhood experiences does not participate in risky behavior, the same health outcomes apply. Heart disease, cancer, increased risk of attempted suicides, and we can go on and on and on on these things. I'm not going into detail on it, but um, we've got to gain an understanding of the elephant in the room. We are not collectively handling our business. We're not collectively uh, strategically looking at the situation. We are highly emotional pe people by nature, but we are relying far too heavily on our emotions to come up with reasonable, rational, and strategic plans. Wishing is not a plan. Hoping is not a plan. And I know I'm about to piss some people off right now, but uh, praying is not a plan. Prayer has its place. I pray every morning. I do prayer and meditation every morning and every night before I go to bed. I have a very intense relationship with the Most High. But I understand that there are certain things that I'm here for. Because if everything was dependent upon getting God to do something, then my place here on earth is empty. It's it, it, it's vassal. It's nothing. And I know that I have purpose. I know that I'm here for a reason. I know that there's something I have to do in order for the outcomes to be what I expect them to be. It's not about simply saying, God, do it. It's about saying, how do I do it? I tell people all the time, the reason that their prayer life is frustrating them is that they are praying to God to deliver them from the giants he sent them to slay. Uh, that's never going to happen. You are never going to be released from the responsibility of your purpose. You're never going to be released from the responsibility of your design, from the responsibility of the reason that you were literally designed to place here. Nobody is here by accident. Nobody is here just to fill space. We live in a world that robs us of our purpose consistently. Our children are at the greatest threat of that happening. We are redirected, recentered, refocused on things that really truly bring no intrinsic value to our lives because we don't know who we are. Blacks are suffering from an identity crisis. That comes from the fact that we were robbed of our VIPs the moment that we became captives. That was the way that we were finally conquered. There's a, diff diff there's a difference between being a captive and being conquered. We didn't become conquered because we were in shackles. We became conquered when they took away our values, our interests, our principles, the very thing that governs how we see this world, how we operate, how we treat one another, how we treat ourselves, what we look for in life, what we are meant to do in life, all the things that matter to us before we became captive were taken away. And then we were assigned a new identity of subservience, a new identity of complacency and compliance, a new identity of thinking that the only way we could have something is that our captive said it was okay. And we have marched to the beat of that robbery 
for 400 years and it is showing in our behavior and in our complacency and in our compliance and, and in how we are waiting on them to fix what we have the power to change. There's a brokenness attached to our identity crisis that must be addressed. There's a brokenness that needs to be addressed at a very intimate level. We need to rediscover black love. We need to understand the power of family, that there needs to be both masculine and feminine energy in the home, that there needs to be both a protector and provider as well as a nurturer and a teacher. There needs to be a collectivism within our community instead of gender wars, and they are precipitating every hostile act. And because we don't know who we are, we're biting on it, hook, line, and sinker. In addition to this workshop, I've done this year alone three other um, workshops or conferences on mental health. Why? Because it's a growing problem in the black community. It's a growing problem uh, over the last five years, we've had a 30% increase in suicides. Black women are mo most likely to be depressed. Black men are the least likely to seek help when depressed. There has been a 49% increase in black male suicides over the la last eight years. You get that almost 50% increase. We actually have a problem with our babies five to 13. Our young girls, five to 13, now are at the top of the suicide rate for that age group. We celebrate the advancement in technology, but we never question the totality of its impact. And what I mean by that is, it's great to be able to access things I use it to run my business. I use it to spearhead research. I use it uh, for so many different things, but at the same, I'm using it now. But at the same time, I have to be aware of the offside of it, the downside of it. And the downside is that uh, research has shown that Instagram is one of the most dangerous uh, platforms for young girls under the age of 17. And where are most of our girls? TikTok and Instagram. See, we are real quick to say, well, I got um, bullied when I was a kid and I, I didn't kill myself. What's going on? These kids just know. When you went to school, the bully was at school. You got to school and primarily most of the time, unless you had just a jerk for a teacher or a teacher that was totally disconnected and unconcerned, as long as you were in the presence of an adult, wasn't the problem so you really only had to worry about your bully in isolated places where there was no adult so you could navigate and move around and you minimized your contact and when you left school you went home and you didn't have to worry about the bully until the next day with social media the bully follows you home that goes back to that stress thing when you're going through these environmental stresses, you're releasing cortisol and adrenaline into your bloodstream. It's a part of your uh, limbic system's fight or flight. It is the activation of that part of the brain that senses a threat and triggers fight or flight. And what happens? Heart rate goes up. Why? Because the blood, because the adrenal gland, which sits right over your kidney, releases adrenaline and cortisol into the bloodstream. Heart rate picks up, blood starts to flow to your extremities, shuts down the prefrontal cortex, and that's extremely important. And 
The reason it shuts down the prefrontal cortex is because the prefrontal cortex is the executive function of your brain. It requires a great deal of blood flow and oxygen to keep you sharp and to keep you aware so that you make good decisions. It's impulse control. It's the executive function of the brain. And so much happens there that everything that calls for reason and processing happens in the prefrontal cortex. Well, when that shuts down, the ability to make reasonable and rational decisions shut down with it. And we're constantly asking like, what was he thinking? What was she thinking when she did that? She wasn't thinking. She was in fight or flight. We got too many family members in constant state of fight or flight. And I ask people all the time, see, fight or flight is a great thing to have when you're in the woods and you see a mountain lion or you see wolves or you see a bear. But I ask the question, what happens when you take the bear home with you? When you are trying to fall asleep with the bear next to you? That's the stressors that so many of us are living under. And we're expecting to perform. And, and, and when in this place, when we're carrying that load, we've got a problem. And it's not going anywhere because we wish it away. Wishing is not a strategy. Hoping is not a strategy. Prayer is not a strategy. Prayer is a practice of communion and communication and fellowship with some, someone, in this instance, with God, the Most High. Prayer is a function of revelation. Most people have been confused and they get upset with me when I tell them this. Prayer is not a function of power. Prayer is a function of revelation. Prayer is where you gain understanding. Prayer is where you gain insight. Prayer is where you get instruction. Power comes from knowledge and execution. Power is a dynamic. Power is about activating something. And then using what you activate to your benefit. And the reason we don't understand this is because we've been fed a bill, bill of goods about power. Those that execute power over us aren't praying for things to happen. They're doing it. Um, I want to challenge us to do better we have a problem and it's not going to get any better this complex elephant in the room has gotten into now where you barely can move and there's hardly any room to breathe it's literally taking the life out of the room my challenge it's time to stand up and take action. It's time to get behind programs. It's time to create programs. It's time to double down on the research. I've been doing research for 30 years. I am at close to 80,000 hours before um, probably August. I'll probably be at 80. then we have to take what we learn with that research and then we have to uh, decipher, process, interpret, and then we must take it and, and transform that into or transact that information into programs and strategies and plans. Um, we've got to come up with codes of conduct. I, I've done all that. The Blueprint uh, 1.0 is on the site. The Black Code of Conduct is on the site. I've spent years looking at this, taking what my ancestors passed down to me, taking what my elders passed down to me, taking what my colleagues have shared with me, and I've put it out there, and it's general, generally accessed. I'm not trying to get no name stamp. I didn't put no copyright on it. I didn't put no trait, but because this isn't about me, it's about my people. I told you when I started this, I wasn't here for the likes. I'm not here for the shares or the pat on the back. I don't need my ego stroked. It's been stroked enough over the course of my life, and when it needs stroking, I'm capable of doing it myself. I know who I am. So 
It isn't about needing somebody to tell me or validate me. This is about, hey, this is what's going on. And it's time to do something about it. Uh, I created Black Men Lead because we need a rite of passage for our black males. That's the only way you're going to socialize, socialize black males without enough black men. It simply is. Plus, if you look at all the other high performing groups, they have rites of passages. Their young males know what it means to be a man in that group as they grow up. They know what they're growing up to become. They know what they're growing up to do. They know what functioning in that group means. They know what's acceptable for them and what isn't. They know what is expected of them. It's our responsibility to change the tide of what we're experiencing. And we won't do it by begging. We'll do it by actively engaging the needs. So on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. As I said before, look in the description box. If you believe in the, what I'm doing, look in the description box. Show your love, show your support, whatever you do. Share this video so that people can hear it, see it, and act accordingly. Whatever that is for you. But it can not be. It can no longer be sitting on the sideline talking about how horrible things are. That can no longer be the answer. That can no longer be what uh, the situation is. It's got to be something where we are actively and collectively making moves. Our time is running out. What will we leave our children, our grandchildren and our great grandchildren? What will we leave those who follow us what's the legacy that we're leaving we're in trouble right now you need to pay attention you need to look around you gentrification is in in, in full swing we're being serially forced uh for and forcefully displaced in record numbers that again has health uh negative health outcomes i've written on that as well We've got, I mean, we've got a problem. What are we going to do? That's it. Look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Uh, man, it's almost 6 o'clock here. I'm going to get ready to get out, but I had to drop this on you before I stepped away from my desk today. Uh, you guys, there's work to be done. It's up to us. On that note, I'm out of here. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.